Hi, I'm Manika Raman Wilms, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. Millions of office workers suddenly went remote when the pandemic first hit, turning kitchen tables and spare rooms into home offices. I was one of them, and maybe you were too. Many of us are still there, and many companies have decided that employees should have the flexibility to work from home at least some of the time. They still want to have an office, but without wasting space with empty desks. The solution is a rise in what's called hot desking. That's when you don't have your own desk at work. Instead, you either come in and find a free spot or book one in advance. The adoption rate of hot desking has really accelerated in the pandemic. So I think that's really the key point because, yes, companies were doing this prior, but now you're seeing it becoming a mainstream idea. Vanmela Subramaniam has a new role at The Globe covering the future of work. She'll tell us about the divide over the idea of hot desking and how this trend could change the culture of our workplaces. This is The Decibel. Vanmela, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. How do people feel about this idea of hot desking? I spoke to about, I would say, 13 employees in total. And the white collar workers, first of all, they worked in Toronto, in, you know, some of the biggest banks, large professional services firms. And so they have desk jobs. And for the most part, I'll tell you that 12 of those employees told me that they did not like hoteling or hot desking. The overarching feedback that I got from employees about hot desking was that it takes away from enjoying being in your own private space in the office. So it makes it more impersonal. Um, there are little things there that, uh, you know, allude to this. So for instance, one person told me I used to have a desk with plants and like I would tend to my plants. So, you know, you just do things like that in an office. You arrange your stuff in a certain way. You have your mug that you leave there. These kinds of things get taken away with hoteling and hot desking. And, you know, I actually spoke to an HR executive at this mid-sized company in Toronto called Bayless Medical. Um, they're a healthcare company. And she was quite upfront that her employees were pretty some of her employees were pretty disappointed when they introduced hot desking. And one of them said to her, well, what about my chair? And you might think that those comments are, you know, not a big deal. But if you have a desk job like we all do and you're sitting down and you're working eight to nine hours a day, ergonomically speaking, it is important to have, you know, good posture and a good chair. And if someone has that and they don't get it anymore from the office space, they might think to themselves, look, why am I coming in when I can do my work from a more comfortable space? So how does hot desking work? Employees are asked to download an app for the most part. You know, there are various apps out there and the app will kind of show you the layout of the office. You use the app to book a desk. And the next time you go back into the office, say if it's two days later, you book another desk. And so you don't necessarily get the same desk that you had the last time. I'm just wondering, Vanmila, did you find any generational differences in people's responses, like younger people versus employees who've who've had a desk for decades and, and are not used to not having that kind of space? Uh, yes, absolutely. And again, I w- want to say this with the caveat that You know, I didn't do an extensive survey and, you know, this is all anecdotal, but I spoke to a couple of employees who were in their mid 20s. So, you know, much younger millennials, borderline Gen Z, and they seem to be more indifferent. But I will say, I think there is almost a universal feeling, and I'm using the term a bit loosely, universal feeling that having to move around every time you come into the office and work in different parts of the office is just not something that people tend to like. Despite that, how popular is hot desking in Canada right now, though? First of all, there's very little data out there on the popularity of the concept, but I'll relate to you what experts I spoke to said. So the 
idea is not a new idea. This has been around for decades. It was first adopted in the late 1980s when these two big accounting firms merged and formed Ernst & Young. And they were trying to figure out a way of moving their employees from three buildings that they had to just one building, seven floors of a single building. And so this idea of renting a desk and only sitting at that desk when you need it to, that came about. Over time, that morphed into or this concept of flexible working kind of expanded. Now, what's interesting, coming back to your question about how you know popular this is, is the adoption rate of hot desking has really accelerated in the pandemic. So I think that's really the key point because, yes, companies were doing this prior, but now you're seeing it becoming a mainstream idea. So BMO has adopted hot desking because I spoke to an employee there and they told me that too. And, you know, one of the consultants that I spoke to from Ernst & Young who advises companies on things like employee engagement experience, how to foster a good work environment. He told me that it's significant because a lot of his inquiries from potential clients revolve around hot desking. They want to know how to make it work. They want to know what are the most efficient apps to use. And these are workplaces that wouldn't have considered this an idea if it hadn't been for the pandemic. It's completely related in the world of corporate white collar work to hybrid work and also, you know, employers accepting that, hey, you know what, maybe not all my employees want to come back into the office five times a week. Can you kind of just complete the circle for us in terms of the reason why this is happening now? Like why exactly have companies now decided to make the shift from the traditional workspace of individual desks to this to this other model? I think the multiple reasons, first of all, pre-pandemic and pandemic. Let's talk about the mainstream adoption of hot desking for a second. So if you think about that, what happened in the pandemic was a, a massive shift towards remote work. You know, white collar workers just figuring out that with technology, you know, they can work from home effectively. Employers realizing, wait a minute, actually, this is working fine. After a few kinks were ironed out over time, it's been two years now. This is working OK. Productivity is, you know, good. In fact, workers are being overworked. So that's one aspect of it. Now, what happened from that is there were all these empty office spaces and employers started realizing, wait a minute, why is it we are paying leasing costs for all these offices where we used to have everyone coming in five days a week? And uh, is that a more cost efficient way of organizing our offices and our workers in our office? And so that that relates to hot desking. So, for example, if you agreed that your employees are allowed to come back on a hybrid basis, say one or two times a week, why have a hundred desks for a hundred employees when you can accommodate with effective planning and the use of technology, 50 desks for a hundred employees? Now that saves you costs, square footage. You don't have to lease out three floors of an office. Perhaps you can just lease out two things like that. So I think for employers, the reasons are pretty clear cut. It's cost. So there's there's the economic argument for this. Uh, are, th are there any other arguments, though, for this kind of, of work? Part of the sell to employees is and I when I say this, I think a lot about the big tech companies um, and startups. You get to be more creative. You collaborate more. If you walk around the office and interact with people from different departments that might spark ideas and, you know, that kind of thing. But um, what researchers I've spoke to have found is that that's not necessarily the case. So it's supposed to kind of foster collaboration and more conversations between people, but but that really isn't isn't happening then. There are researchers out there that found that it actually did the complete opposite. So, you know, there's a really good piece in the Harvard Business Review from 2019, actually, pre-pandemic. These two researchers looked at you know, interactions between employees in Fortune 500 companies that had transitioned from cubicles to open offices. 
And so, you know, they collected that data for about eight weeks. And what they found is that face-to-face interactions between employees dropped by about 70% after these firms transitioned to open offices. And, you know, what made up for those face-to-face interactions was electronic interactions. So regardless of the fact that people could walk around and talk, the end result was that people would just use internal communication channels like Slack, for example, to talk to each other. And that kind of killed the whole idea of being collaborative and creative and all the stuff that employers sold to you. And do these researchers have an idea of why that trend kind of had the opposite effect that originally was supposed to? Yeah, so it's really interesting and in a way almost counterintuitive. So the idea being that If you are in an environment where there is constant noise around you and interaction and movement, it doesn't foster deep thought and deep thinking. And, you know, that's just simply put, there's not a lot of silence. And what happens when people are put in that environment is they try to find the silence and they try to find ways in which to engage in deep concentration and thinking. And so, for example, They might put their headphones on and just try to find a corner in the office, sit there, focus, and then just walk out, you know, I'm done my day kind of thing. How might this change the culture uh, of an office going forward? So I think what's interesting about what it's doing to the culture of an office in this world that we live in right now, which is, you know, navigating the pandemic. And I'm saying this based on anecdotes of talking to people and also, you know, HR executives and just people on the employer side is that if your goal as a company is to get people into the office, if you don't create a conducive environment for them to do that, they might not end up coming into the office. The other thing that it does, and, you know, I found this anecdote really useful. This consultant at Ernst & Young, Daryl Wright, he was telling me that what is the point of going into the office when you're going to log into your computer and go on Zoom calls and team calls and do everything that you do remotely? What would incentivize the employee from bracing a commute spending money on it. You know, in Canada, you have to contend with the weather. So I think there are a lot of factors that might contribute to this system, I guess, just not working in a desired way. And in terms of, I mean, the way that this office culture kind of plays out too, even within this model, I would imagine that some people like like managers are still going to have desks or probably offices. Does this also create maybe a more distinct hierarchy uh, in, in an office workspace? The hierarchy factor is huge. So what happens when you institute hot desking for everyone in the office except a few people? So, you know, say certain managers get to keep the offices, certain senior employees or C-suite executives get to keep the offices in a way that fosters a feeling of inequity when you're in the office. So, you know, the thinking will go, how come someone else gets their private space that they can make their own and I don't get my private space that I can make their own. Why Why am I less worth an employee than th- that other person? So we actually put a, a call out on Twitter about people's um, ideas of, of hot desking when we knew we were going to be talking to you today about this. Uh, and we got a lot of feedback. And, and one of the things that kept coming up was cleanliness uh, of a shared desk space. Is this something that that you've heard, too, especially in in pandemic times, that people think about the cleanliness of of the place where they're working? Oh, absolutely. It was a lot of what came up with, I think, almost every person I interviewed brought up the fact that they feel that they don't like sharing desks because they're just not sure whether the desk is clean. It was almost as simple as that. For that matter, I saw a lot of those comments in response to my tweet about the article. And I will just, of course, point out that the Globe does hot desking now, too. So so this is something that, that our own organization has adopted. What did researchers tell you, though? Is, is there anything that might make this model of hot desking more appealing to people? Yeah. So, you know, the way in which you can strike a balance here in this whole, you know, tension between employers and employees is 
to figure out within your organization what exactly is the role of the office. So what is the role of the office within your organization? Is it a place to foster collaboration, to have meetings, to brainstorm? Is it a place where people can do deep writing and thinking and have alone time, you know, while they do their work? Or is it a place where you need to strike a better balance between doing both? And so one of the things that's happened uh, recently to the way employers think about offices is that they are skewed more towards having more public space and there's just not enough private space in an office. And I think that pendulum needs to swing back a little bit towards people having a better balance between private and public space. Pamela, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you so much, Menika. That's it for today. I'm Manika Raman Wilms. Our producers are Madeline White and Cheryl Sutherland. David Crosby edits the show. Kasia Mihailovich is our senior producer, and Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next week. <laughs>